Welcome to session number 196 of Scanner School. Today we're talking about traveling with a Unication pager as your scanner. We have a special guest on the podcast episode today, actually a returning guest on the podcast today. So this guest will explain how he's set up his Unication product. He'll be doing the expl- explaining. Again, I am a Unication dealer, so this is one of those deals where I am taking that hat off, putting on my scanner school hat, and asking the questions that you would like to have answers to. So again, I'm coming at this from a hobbyist instead of coming at it as somebody who is actually a Unication dealer. So we're going to talk with our special guest today about how he set up his pager to go through multi states on different trunk radio systems. Today's podcast is sponsored by our two brand new training courses. Our free SDR course, The Ultimate Beginner's Guide to Software Defined Radio, will get you started with SDRs in an afternoon. We will show you what hardware and accessories to buy to get started with Software Defined Radio. Then we'll show you the step-by-step how-to to to install the drivers, tune your first frequency with SDR Sharp, and then have you monitoring digital at the end of this free course. Our advanced course continues with beginner's course left off and levels up your SDR experience. In this course, you'll learn even more about software-defined radio. We will show you how you can substitute an SDR for your high-end digital scanner, how to monitor HD radio, monitor trunk systems and overhead data with Unitrunker, and even how to monitor all the talk groups on a system and never miss a beat with SDR trunk. You can sign up for both courses at courses.scannerschool.com. Before we start this week's podcast, I'd like to take a moment to thank our Patreon supporters. Patreon is a month-to-month sponsorship platform. We have three different support tiers, each with different benefits. But the most valuable tier is our $5 a month tier. This equates to sponsoring the podcast for about a dollar per episode. Now, not only do our $5 Patreon supporters receive the podcast early, but they also receive a commercial-free version of the podcast delivered directly to their podcast player. Some may say that the included squelchy sticker pack that is mailed to your home is the best benefit of the $5 level, but I think it's the community or the club that is growing at this level. You see, we meet once a month on Zoom, and we have a roundtable discussion about scanning, ask questions, offer advice. Some of the members are answering other people's questions, and we just talk with our fellow scanner school classmates. This is an exclusive group for our $5 Patreon members. Now, again, if all this wasn't enough at that level, you'll also receive discounts to upcoming Scanner School courses and offerings. Now, you can help support Scanner School by going to www.scannerschool.com slash Patreon or www.scannerschool.com slash support. Now, I'd like to thank all of our Patreon supporters at all levels, and they are Arthur Heron, Bill K., Brian King, Buzz Gold, Chris Paris, Craig Harper, Dan, Dave Pasco, David C., Danny Crotty, Ed Walsh, Edward Bramlett, Floyd Goff, Glenn Wright, Greg Johnson, Guy Lee, Jack Haycock, Jacques Berry, James Broxson, James Felling, James Peruta, Jay Reed, Jeff Block, Jeff Chapman, Jenny Taylor, Jim B., Jim Heinrich, John Keel, John Sweeney, John Goldenberg, Ken Newberry, Kenneth Fowler, Kevin Zwicky, Lenny Bauer, Les Stevenson, Lynn Smith, Mark Beebe, Mason Kramer, Michael Gorman, Michael Kroger, Nicholas Stenger, Paul Teal, Randy Cummings, Raymond Hill, Robert, Robert Kansler, Ronnie Bach, Sal Marandola, Terry Weatherford, Tim Mazza, TJ, Todd Glendai, and William Arcand. Now let's start the podcast. Welcome to The Scanner School, a podcast dedicated to the scanner radio hobby. Class is about to begin. Here is your host, Phil Lichtenberger. All right, again, welcome back to Scanner School. Again, this podcast is here to teach you everything to know about the scanner radio hobby. My name is Phil Lichtenberger, and my amateur radio call sign is W2LE. And as a reminder, I need your questions for the very next Ask Scanner School podcast session, which always releases on the first Tuesday of every month. You can submit your questions via our normal voicemail number, 516-308-2885, or by using our Speak Pipe voicemail link or over at scannerschool.com slash ask. So today's guest is Nathan McMullen. And Nathan is a returning guest. He was actually on the podcast uh, back on session number 73. And we discussed how to scan on a budget, which is a really great podcast session. And then 
We also spoke to him again on session number 95, where we talked about working around simulcasts, you know, using different radios and different techniques to work around simulcasts when you're monitoring a trunk system that primarily is in a simulcast environment. So, as I said in the pre-roll here, we're talking about using a unication pager as your primary scanner while you're traveling. And again, disclaimer, I am a unication dealer. I own eastcoastpagers.com. But we're looking at this today from a scanner radio user. So again, I'm not sitting here in this podcast episode selling a pager to you guys, right? I'm asking questions regarding using it as a scanner. Because again, I believe that you should understand these are pagers but for the most people listening to the podcast, you're going to want to use this right as a scanner radio. It's very important for me to explain the differences between a scanner radio and what this unit is, which is a pager. So let's look at it this way, right? Traveling with a unication pager, or any pager for that matter, should be thought of the same way as traveling with a two-way radio that is only able to receive on certain bands, one of the things we need to remember is that we need to set up these radios before we even leave the house and hit the road or expect to have to make tweaks via a computer and software while we are traveling or stopping over at a hotel or a campground for the night, right? These are the trade-offs, though, when we go from a commercial-grade product versus a consumer-grade product like a scanner radio. Now, commercial-grade products are built for the public safety or the professional user whose job it is to basically safely rely on the radio that's in their hands or in their vehicle, right? Their radio or their pager in this case is a tool to help them get their job done. And in most cases, right, you don't want the end user to have control over programming or changing the settings on the radios because if they had access to do that, as we all know, right, they would be fiddling with buttons and they wouldn't be able to talk to anybody that they need to, right? Most people you get out there, they're not really radio operators when it comes to the public safety. It's, it's, it's a tool at their disposal. They want to know how to go onto a position, talk or listen to a dispatcher, right? They want to turn to another position and talk to their fellow coworkers or mutual aid or something like that. Now, a consumer-grade piece of gear is built for the non-commercial user. Again, this is where the amateur comes into amateur radio. Or another example here is a hobbyist like us in the scanner radio hobby. These consumer-grade radios have all the buttons, the options, the keypad features that we have grown used to on our radio scanners. But how many times, let's be honest here, how many times have we all pushed a button and then panicked because now the radio is doing something that it shouldn't be doing, right? Did we break it? Did we lock something out? Why does it say public safety? Why does it say highway instead of what I want to listen to, right? How many times have we screwed something up and had to break out the manual? Commercial devices, right? Like commercial two-way radios with the communication pages, they are purposefully built so that accidents like that don't happen when they are in use. That's my disclaimer on these products before we even get into the conversation with Nathan. Again, I am a unication dealer. If you listen to this podcast episode and you decide that you want to purchase a unication device for your scanner radio needs, again, I would recommend it. I, even if I wasn't a dealer, I would have a couple. You can reach out to me over at eastcoastpagers.com. So let's go ahead and jump right into this conversation that we had with Nathan. Hey, Nathan, thanks again for coming back on the Scanner School Podcast. Appreciate you having here. Yes, sir. I'm glad to be back, and thanks for having me again. So for those who haven't listened to the other two podcasts you were on, uh, why don't you go ahead and give a quick rundown on uh, your background in scanning? So I started back in 2017. Um, I think, oh, goodness, I can't remember. It was the first time I think I did it with you was in 2019, I believe, right? I think we did scan on a budget for the first one. Yes, we did that one. That was a good one. <laughs> and, yeah. and times haven't really changed on that one. It's, I think everything there, because there hasn't been any 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 difference in uh, hardware since then. I think all that we talked about two years ago it still applies today. So, oh yeah, absolutely. And then I know a second time we the second time we did um, the simulcasting stuff, which I'm happy to report is no longer a problem now. 
hence the Excellent. topic of this video for the for the podcast today. Hence the topic. So. Right, right. And the solution to so so let's go through the summer cast really quick. So you had an issue where it depended where you put the radio basically in your house or in your room, depended uh or or basically dictated whether or not you were gonna listen to anything or not, basically because you were getting right, the cast yeah. coming in. Yeah. And it and, and really it's it goes to prove, right, the point that you move the scanner a foot or two one way or the other or move it to the other side of the of the of the room that you're in and uh yeah, simulcast can be a real pain in the neck. So. Yeah, well, especially now, like I was listening to one of the previous podcasts about how, you know, we have a scanner shortage right now. And I think simulcast for some people is going to be kind of a pain in the butt right now, especially with a lot of people buying these uh, used scanners now that don't have those simulcast mm-hmm. capabilities. Yep. And that's going to just add to the frustration level that some people have when they get into it. They're going to, you know, first of all, have these these new radios that that they're not used to and then they're going to spend all this time trying to program it and then all of a sudden they're going to realize i can't listen to anything <laughs> why can't i hear right. it? then they all of a sudden realize about <laughs> simulcast and then they'll be like oh you know i mean it'd be it's <laughs> <laughs> it's be a lot there but uh but you've definitely got a good way around it right now and uh again i'm i'm going to treat this as a scanner enthusiast and not as a unication dealer. So I'm going to put that disclaimer mm-hmm. out there right now that I am asking the questions based on the hobby's perspective. And and even though I may know some of the answers already, I'm still presenting them, you know, for you to well, answer because you're here, you're here to uh, to well, be our guest. So I, I will say I, I did buy a pager from you back in the middle of COVID in May of 2020. And that was it was an expensive purchase, but it was the best purchase I ever made. And it still holds on today. I'm glad to, good. Glad, so. Definitely glad to hear that uh, you're still happy with the purchase. So that's always <laughs> good to know. So uh, let's talk about that. So you've got a Unication pager. Uh, remind uh, me again which which flavor you purchased. Uh, I purchased just a G4, the 7, 800 megahertz, because that's pretty much all I need at this moment with our uh, local system right now. Perfect. And you bought that primarily because you needed something that would be portable and would work well with Summercast, correct? Yes, all of my uh, radios and scanners are portables right now, and I I have one base station, but it's an aviation radio only. I just I love the portable stuff. Yep, and I mean I I go both ways with that. It's I, I go through a phase where it's desktop only, and then I go through a phase where it's it's handheld only. So lately, it's been just buying both. <laughs> so. Right. Yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, if you, if you count a base, the SDRs as a base station, I don't know if you count that or not, because I, I don't, I just got one of my SDRs portable today, actually, but usually most of them are just tied to a broadcastify call system. Usually is where mm-hmm. they are all the time. Okay. Yeah. I would, I would put, um, I would put SDRs basically in their own category. <laughs> oh, absolutely. So I, I wouldn't. I wouldn't even. <laughs> I would even put them in there. Just like what you got here, right? The pager is uh, the unication is its own category, also. Right. It's a commercial. It's a commercial use uh, receiver. Many people are using them as scanners, but primarily their their primary function is to be a pager. So, how are you using on your day to day? How are you using the G four? So right now with the G four, I actually have. A lot in the scan list. I have, we have multiple police departments in my area, which I actually moved back to Louisville recently. Um, I actually graduated college back in December. So I was in Richmond originally in Kentucky, but now I'm back in Louisville, Kentucky. So right now I pretty much have it kind of split up right now. Uh, the 1.3 update from them actually with that talk group hold actually saved a lot for me. So yeah, that was a nice, nice yeah. addition. <laughs> <laughs> I'm still, I'm still working on them to get the uh, the delay time added to that because that'd be yeah. a, that'd be a nice little feature as well. That'll that'll definitely take things up a notch, especially when you got those larger scan lists. Right, and you know it holds up to 64 talk groups at mm-hmm. a time, and that's plenty, you know, because I'm like I'm actually I got the the uh, PPS pulled up right now, the programming software, and I'm actually looking at it and trying to go through it here. Um, you know, I got once uh, one zone for mutual aid. You know, like other counties around us, and then the main zone has got like our main metro police, the sheriffs on there, as well as um, the fire channels. But I also have one zone that's it, it's set for toneouts. Like I spent during COVID once I bought that pager about three hours 
decoding all the two tones. And I think that's one of my favorite parts of the whole page is the two tone stuff with the fire department. Yeah. I've, I've spent, uh, cause I put a whole document together for the County here and it's, it can get addicting. You could just sit there yeah. and record, you know, over your scanner, the two tones. I was using pro scan for that. Then you go in there cause everything's all, all date and, and, timestamps right with, with the alpha tags and everything else all the meta tags are, are all in there so you can go back and play them back and you know what tones they're going to be or what frequencies they are if they have their own uh, dispatch channels and pretty soon you can start building your own database so i know uh kenneth was on the podcast a while back and he's gone through and and put in a whole bunch of radio ids in the pager as well so i think he's got close to the pager maxed out on how many radio ids oh, wow. they can fit so yeah that, that'll be the next one for you so i've gone down that <laughs> as well with with software yeah. like unitrunker and stuff like that where you just start you know looking at all the radio ids and uh it's one of those things it, it definitely enhances your scanner radio hobby a bit because now not only do you know who's keying up the microphone but you also know who they're you know they're talking to on that talk group so it's really cool. So yeah, go ahead. Uh, didn't mean to interrupt you on that one. No, no, you're fine. And I also, I have like one zone that's separated for all the um, public works and stuff. Now we start to get into kind of the big thing on this uh, podcast is the different states. I'm mm -hmm. sandwiched in between Indiana, Ohio, and Tennessee. Well, I've got one separate, I got one zone separate for each state. One, like for example, each one of them has a zone for the state police for example, Indiana, obviously Marion County and Indi in Indianapolis has its own separate system. So I plugged that one in there as well. And then I just have what, what I just called the safe T scan, which is the name of the system. And it's pretty much just going to monitor the system the whole time. Like it's just going to pick up anything on the nearest site it can catch. And then I also put in flight watch, which is the uh, AeroVac stuff, which I'm I've actually got into listening pretty recently, so I went ahead and plugged that in there. But that's like the example I use for Indiana. All right. And then your system that you've got that you listen to day to day, I mean, is that a statewide system or is that down on the county level? No, that's county system? level only. Uh, county they level are only. talking. Okay. Uh, there is uh, words of building statewide on the forums is what they're talking about, but I don't know how long it's going to be. But I'm only at gotcha. county level right now. Okay. I'm just wondering that. And how many transmitter sites are there uh, basically on that county system? Um, and throughout the entire county, I want to say eight to 10. I don't have an exact number. But, okay. um, but you're, how many do you have right. when you listen at home? How many do you, how many are you scanning through? I'm usually just on one site at a time. Oh, okay. so I got to make a correction on that. We have three separate sites. I misread the question. We do have three sites. We have uh, Oldham County, Jefferson County, and Bullock County. Uh, both, all three counties are on the system. I, uh, what's nice is the main site in Jefferson has all the county's talk groups on that system. So I don't have to switch sites. I can just stay on one site and then get everything. Well, with the unication pager, that's a good thing then because the pager will sit there on a site once it locks into it and will not scan through like a scanner will do. So for you to have one site that you can lock the pager on and get what, everything you want to listen to, that's, that's the lifesaver. Right, because I have, you know, on one side of my mutual aid, of my mutual aid zone, I have the um, talk groups in for site one, which is Jefferson County, but then I have it on its actual site of Bullock County, if that makes sense. So if I'm traveling to another county, I at least will have coverage there in case I lose it with the main one in Jefferson. Yep, yep. So let's talk about, you know, statewide systems or multiple county systems that you have, because you were just talking about just now the safe, or oh, is it the uh, the Indiana, right? Was it the Indiana yeah, state uh, system? It's, yeah. It's, uh, yeah, it's uh, safety. Safety, right. So yeah. you, I guess you go into Indiana and you, and you and you drive around through there? Or, I mean, how close are you really to, to going into that state? Because you said you have multiple states that you listen to. So I'm bordered right on the Ohio River with Indiana. Okay. I can't get them in the house, unfortunately, but I can get them if I, you know, if I'm driving around outside. But there's occasions like I went up to uh, Oshkosh, Wisconsin, a couple of weeks ago, and went to the air show up there. And I had I drove through Indiana, Illinois, and I actually had both of their statewide systems plugged in there. And it was it was pretty the way I had it set up. Um, it was actually performing very well. I have learned that. The, the pager can hold up to 256 sites and channels, but I've found that it actually crashes the pager a lot. I've learned that the hard way. Yeah. If you put a lot of stuff in there, eventually <laughs> it's going to, it's going to max right. out the RAM on there. 
But uh, but how how do you normally set that up though? Because again, you you talk about a lot of stuff here, right? If, I mean, again, if you were to travel up and go on the, on that uh, safety system, there's the, it's statewide, right? So you've got all these tower sites in there. Of course, the radio, uh, the scanner, or the pager rather, only locks on to one site at a time. So when you figure out you're going to program up your your pager to go traveling with it, how do you how do you set it up? I mean, that's it's it's completely a different mindset than traveling with the scanner. So again, like, you know, you said before, the pager can only walk onto one site. So since I usually travel, I think when I last did the testing on it, which was a couple, about a month ago, I would say, um, I traveled again all the way up into from Indiana all the way into Illinois. What I did was I tricked the pager into thinking that the entire statewide system was one site. So I went into the programming and under the site list, instead of having it 256 or how many ever there are, I put the, um, the, uh, site ID and the RFSS ID as like the wild card setting, which is two F's. And I basically uh-huh. tricked the pager into thinking that it was one, the whole state was one site and it actually did not crash one bit the whole time I had it on. And we were in, in Indiana for about three or four hours. And it didn't crash once. So you basically just put all the control channels into the site list. Yeah. So like under the, it's like there's a separate in the programming, it's control channels. I just imported all the control channels in from radio reference because you have the uh, import feature now with the newer Mm -hmm. uh, PPS, which is awesome. I highly recommend using it. And then I just deleted all the sites and then just put the wildcard FF in there. So that way it would scan the control channels and then whenever it picked the closest one, it would just lock on and stay on it. Okay. That's definitely a way of doing it. The other way I, I was thinking maybe you were doing it was you'd set up like zones uh, or, or dial positions. So like, for example, here uh, in, in Suffolk County, the P25 network is split into layers. So the 800 layer has got, I don't know, they, they've got the buses, but they've also got police. I don't know why they put the county buses and the county police, I guess because it's the county level thing. But yet the fire departments are on the 700 layer. So it's different. So if the pager, if you put both 700 and 800 in there, then the pager locks onto one of those two layers. You're not going to get half your scan list. So if you just set it up and I, you know, you say, okay, here's the 800 layer and all the PD talk groups are on the 800. That's great. You've got the pager set up that way. And then you turn the dial and now all of a sudden you've got all your 700 talk groups with just a 700 layer programmed in there. So I was wondering if that's the way you've done it. And I know uh, a buddy of mine too, what he does is there's a MTA system up here. And what he does is he puts it into, he's got one zone, one key set up with the city stuff. And then when he goes out of range, he turns the dial and then he comes into the Long Island stuff. And I said, well, if you're going to go out of range, just put both systems in the same the same position because when the pager goes out of range, it will automatically find the other one for you. And he goes, Oh yeah, I could do that. So it comes out with an <laughs> idea of like, how, how are you setting it up? So, so originally I thought, you know, we were doing, uh, you know, the emails back and forth. I thought so that's what you were doing is you set up just small groups and, and you were defining just a couple of, uh, of sites basically to each zone or key position combination. But it sounds like to me you just made one one list up with wildcards and just blew that into the uh, the pager and let the pager just lock on to whatever it could find with with that control channel on it. Yeah, and you know, especially with the state police stuff, it's a little bit easier. That it's not it's not one say it's easier. You can use that option because you know the the regions are so big. I did used to do it at least on the tack end because I would actually travel to Tennessee fairly often. I would do sectors. So like, you know, the north, northern counties, uh, northern sites, eastern, southern, and western. That's usually how I used to do it. But I don't know. I found it a lot easier that way. Doing it with just one site and it pulls in as much as it can. All right. So now let's just say you're going to plan on taking a trip or you're, you're planning out and you're mapping out your uh, your scanner or your pager. So how do you, how do you do it? Like, you know, in your head or on paper or what, what's the workflow that you go through? I mean, we talked about it just a second ago. You, you set up the sites or the, or the trunk systems and then you import the sites and then you wildcard all the sites out into a single list with a wildcard basically. So you got one, one, one site with all the control channels and a wildcard. But 
beyond that, there's got to be some sort of mapping out that you do in order to make sure that the page is going to work where you expect it to work. Because again, it's a different animal, right, than than a scanner. So, what's the uh, what's the process from start to finish, really, that you go through when you decide that okay, I'm going to go traveling with this pager, and I'm going to need it to go onto this system. Well, the first thing I look at is where am I going to be primarily? Well, usually I'm primarily on the highway. So I'm going to look at state police. That's the biggest thing. You know, uh, people, you know, getting pulled over, just people, many people may interpret this as, as like, oh, he's trying to avoid the law. Not, not at all. I just like to, you know, hear what people get into and, you know, how like, oh, it's ahead of me 20 miles. I'll be able to see the craziness. A big one is the accidents on 65. I actually have avoided a couple accidents using the pager. The other thing too is, is I also look at to see what other systems are in that state. For example, Ohio, I did a road trip up to Cleveland a couple of weeks ago. And what I ended up doing was, is I ended, Cleveland's got a separate system. So I ended up doing was plugging that system into my Ohio zone name but put the Cleveland channel knob in there and put whatever talk groups I wanted. Uh, you can, there's two ways I look at doing this. You can either do a monitor, meaning it'll pick up everything, but Cleveland's a pretty big system. Like there's a lot of talk groups. So I just put in like police and fire, just the basics. And then, and then on my uh, others, I have another channel knob that j- is monitor for the entire statewide system. So if I just want to pick up anything on the site I'm listening to, I'll do it that way. That was actually one of the questions I just wrote down to ask you. So you do set up a basically a talk group search in the yeah. pager. So if anything is going on, you could just, yeah. just listen to it. Now, the hard part with this is there's a little bit of extra work you have to do while you're driving or well, not driving, but if you're in the passenger seat like I usually am. The problem is, is that the pager can only take up to 64 talk groups in its own. So unfortunately, you have to either have the talk group list printed out or you have to have it pulled up somewhere to see just to just to see what you're pulling up. If you really are curious, like I am. Right. And again, that comes with a lot of the pre-planning and you can at least print all this stuff out from PPS and get a whole printout of of what's in the pager. But right. yeah, again, it's it's not a scanner, right? So it does have its limitations as to what you're doing there. Because again, it's built for public safety and for public service, but they do work extremely well with a as, as you're using it as a scanner. It does require a little bit of thinking outside the box, but that's what you're doing here. It's working out very well for you. So what are the, some other tips or tricks you have with traveling with a uh, Unication pager? So the biggest thing I have to say is use your Bluetooth because, you know, like, you know, if you have family like I do, they sometimes get tired of hearing it <laughs> after a couple hours <laughs> in the car. So right. usually what I do is um, I hook my AirPods to my pager. And I think that's awesome with the Bluetooth. I mean, that's the biggest thing. If you have people that not saying they don't hate your hobby, but, you know, they, you know, after they're like after a while, they're like, you know, I don't want to hear it. I recommend, you know, using the earphones as well. That's a big one. And right. But another thing I usually like to do is, is like, hypothetically, you go out of range somewhere like, you know, maybe you travel into a state like Wisconsin was an example where when I went up in Wisconsin, I didn't have the VHF band. I only had seven, 800. So what I ended up having to do was until I got into like the Milwaukee or the, or the Oshkosh area where there are seven, 800, some of it is at least I had to just sit on, um, a call or like the the statewide interop channels because that's all I could really pick up at the time and I didn't I didn't I brought a I took an XPR with me too for like event security and stuff because I was actually a volunteer at the event when I went up there but I couldn't use that because obviously it's not a scanner it's a commercial radio that you can't edit on the fly just like the page right so right. unfortunately when I went out of range of the state system I ended up having to monitor statewide stuff until eventually I was able to come back in the range of an 800 system that I had set up. Gotcha. So I was, I was going to circle back on the uh, Bluetooth thing, but you, you're using your AirPods. So that's good to hear that they actually work with it. Now, when you pair your AirPods into the pager, are you still able to use the AirPods on your iPhone? Or you got to detach them from the pager then, and then use them on the uh, the phone? So I have, unless someone else has found a different way around it, I've had to detach them individually. Yeah. I can't use my phone and the pager at the same time. But I will say the biggest thing that I do not like about the AirPods is that you have to turn the volume up so loud. 
Oh, really? At the same time, it's, oh yeah. With mine, um, I have it up to a hundred and I, and I, and if I'm in a busy environment, I'm not busy environment, I should say a loud environment, I have trouble hearing it. Like there was one time I was helping my uncle who he's a, he's a DJ in Louisville. And I would just, you know, when I was helping tear down music equipment, I would just have the pager in my pocket or on my hip with my earphones and with that music going on, I had it at full volume. I still couldn't. I could barely even hear it through my AirPods, wow. even with the noise cancellation on. Okay. So you're using the pros then? Yeah, I'm using the pros. Yep. Gotcha. Big spender. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, it was, it, was a, well, it was a graduation <laughs> present, so <laughs> that's okay. Yeah, there you go. No. <laughs> yep. <laughs> I, I don't blame you. I, I got the I got the uh, second gen regular ones, and and I love them. I mean, I got them in my ear right now to listen to you. So they work really <laughs> well. I'm, I'm I, you know they make good stuff. So too bad there's no uh, scanner software for the Apple product. Right. But, uh, that's a whole well, other, really, that's a whole other podcast. Yeah. <laughs> well, I want to circle back really quick to Bluetooth. Uh-huh. It's hit or miss. I forgot to mention that it is hit or miss on Bluetooth. Okay. At least it is for me. Gotcha. I have car Bluetooth, Bluetooth in my car. It doesn't work there. Um, I have a small speaker that it doesn't work with. It mainly works with AirPods. And I do have a uh, speaker mic that I use for Zello. Mm -hmm. And that works surprisingly. But it's honestly, if you end up looking at a G4 or G5 or any of those pagers that have Bluetooth, it's hit or miss. So you got to be careful with that. Right, right. That's that's what I've heard. Yeah, I've never actually personally played around with the Bluetooth on them. But uh, I know some people (laughs) that are finding success with it. And I guess others, Mm -hmm. like you're saying, is it a miss with it? So did you know there are ways to help support the Scanner School podcast that doesn't take any time or any extra money on your part? If you go to scannerschool.com slash support, you will find we have several ways that you can continue to do your online shopping and help support us. We have links to Amazon. If you click on our link before you go to Amazon, anything you buy from there, will help support Scanner School. Now, if you're in a market for a brand new scanner, an antenna, other accessories, we have links to Scanner Master, where you can not only purchase a scanner and accessories, but you can also get your radio programmed. And by clicking on our link before you buy, you are helping to support the podcast. Now, if you're in a market for software, we have links to Butel. And if you want something new to you, we also have links to ebay again just go to scannerschool.com slash support before you make your purchases and you are helping to support scanner school at no additional cost to you this session of scanner school is sponsored by east coast pagers now east coast pagers is one of my online companies and we are unication apollo and swiss phone dealers serving the north american market now if you're looking for a personal use pager or one for your department we can get you a quote at the very best prices. So why does a company like East Coast Pagers support Scanner School? I think that every Scanner Radio user should at least put one pager in their collection of radios. The reason why is very simple. It frees up your scanner to just do scanning, and then you have one radio that's dedicated to your local fire activity. Now, with a pager, you can have voice storage. You can do tone outs. You can keep it silent. You can go back the next day and listen to what you've missed overnight. It's more than you can do with an out-of-the-box scanner. And with today's pagers having multiple frequencies and even having multiple channels in a scan list, like the Unication G1 can do eight channels in a scan list. It has 64 memory channels, and out of the box, it comes with 11 minutes of stored voice and a desktop charger. The G2s to G5s, they do P25 phase one and phase two in simulcast environments with stored voice, paging on conventional NP25. Oh, and they're upgradable too to DMR type one and type two. They are more rugged than today's consumer based scanners. And with a pager like a Swiss phone S quad, you won't even realize you're wearing one. It'll help keep you informed as to what's going on in your neighborhood. So again, eastcoastpagers.com or contact me directly phil at eastcoastpagers.com do you have a new scanner you're having problems understanding how it works maybe you're new to the entire home patrol database of programming and you can't figure out sentinel did you get a new sdr and you're trying to figure out how to install it or you want to learn how to use unitrunker dsd plus maybe set up a pioware or even just make some changes and you don't understand how the system and the equipment works, the podcast might be great for you, but maybe you need a little bit more of one-on-one help with setting something up. I'm available to do just that with you with our private tutoring sessions. You can book me online by going to scannerschool.com slash consulting for a one-hour session 
And it's great because we can actually share computer screens remotely and I can guide you through step by step as if I was sitting right next to you. So again, book me for an hour at scannerschool.com slash consulting for your scanner radio one-on-one tutoring session. National Communications Magazine is your personal library of scanner, CB, GMRS, FRS, MURS, and two-way radio articles written by the best minds in the business over the past three decades. Your NatCom personal online access account allows you to download the newest issues of America's Hobby Radio Magazine, as well as back issues too. So visit natcommag.com to download your free sample issues and sign up today. That's natcommag.com for National Communications Magazine. Another question for you too. Have you ever tried with the, the pager just putting it into wildcard mode, 100% wildcard mode? So for the site, uh, for the system and the site, and then put it into basically the, the talk group uh, search mode and then just see if the pager locks onto anything? Have, have you tried anything like that yes. at all? So on the statewide system, yes. On, on the statewide, I usually do that. I have it set up to. I have um, also Spectrum. I forget what they call it. Spectrum scanning on. Is that what it's called? Yes. Or? Yep. I have those. Where it just looks for the next enabled. control channel, right? Yeah. Okay. I I have those on enable as well. And usually, I don't. Now, usually, when I'm traveling. I usually focus unless I'm going to stay somewhere for a long period of time. I usually focus on just picking something up nearby. If I'm going to stay somewhere for a longer period of time, I may start going around and looking to see what's like, if there's anything new, usually I just take what's in the database and roll with it, which is also a mm-hmm. risk as well. I will say that is a risk that I do take sometimes. Why is that a risk? Radio reference is great information, but it may not always be accurate. Right. So Cause it is community driven. Right. Right. Exactly. Right. So I'm, there may be a new site that I didn't have programmed in there that has not just been created or started Heck, I I already have the zones for all these um, states put in there. And I did this about a month ago. So things could have changed between now and then about right. frequencies or sites. So you do take a gamble when you do this. But also having the spectrum scan on, that could also help as well. Yep, exactly. And uh, how many zones? I mean, how many zones have you? You, you got to have the pager pretty much zoned out at this point, right? Well... I've barely scraped the surface. I have nine. Uh, okay. So it's, a, so it's about, uh, <laughs> about 80 less than I thought you'd have. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so like I have, again, I'll go over really quick because I haven't pulled up here. I have one oh. for my, my home system. Uh, I have another one for my home system with some of the, like the interop talk groups, inc- including some of the uh, nearby sites. I have one okay. that's dependent on the, de- the public works in my city and county. I have one that literally, and this may be a topic we bring up here shortly. I actually have a zone that is linked with all of the seven or 800 megahertz uh, trunking systems in the state. So I have all those in a zone. Okay. And then I have, you know, Indiana, Ohio, Tennessee, and then I have um, an analog zone and a digital zone for all the eight call and eight tax stuff. Gotcha. Can you explain, you just touched on it briefly there for a second. Uh, you said the 700, uh, 800 link, you said. We would talk about that in a second. So what? can you explain a little bit more what, what it is that you have going on in, in, uh, in that zone? Yeah. So the state of Kentucky is not a full, it doesn't have a statewide system, at least not yet. So we do have a handful of counties and cities that do have 800 or 700 megahertz systems on them. And I just went on ahead and went in there on a zone and pretty much put all these, all those systems in there with a handful of talk groups in there. And so like if I'm traveling, I can, it's, I usually don't do it in the state of Kentucky. I'm usually taking a radio for our state police because they're on UHF multicast. But um, if I'm, you know, if I'm headed to a County that I know I'm going to be in for a while that has a seven or 800 megahertz system in it, I go on ahead and plug it in there just to have it just on the off chance that I could use it there. Right, because again, programming on the fly is, is not going to happen. <laughs> so you've got to right, make sure so, it's all, yeah. all done ahead of time, which again, what we were saying before is like you've really got to map these things out and mm-hmm. really do some planning and, and some homework in order to figure out exactly where it is that uh, that you want to scan and what you want to listen to. So that's uh, that's definitely got to make things a little bit uh, 
a little more difficult setting up than actually uh, a, a scanner or something like that. But again, too, you were talking about you had the APX unit. So you're kind of in the same mindset at that point anyway, because you've got to set that APX unit up ahead of time. So you kind of you kind of killing two birds with one stone when you when you actually set up the pager. Yeah, I, I don't have an APX. I kind of wish I did. <laughs> oh, I thought but, you said um, that's what you had before. The, oh, the Motorola, had, uh, you said. I had an XP. I have a. Uh, I took an oh, XPR. XPR. XPR sorry. Okay. It's a sixty-five fifty. Yeah, a little bit of difference in price. <laughs> yeah, very, yeah. I mean, I actually have a uh, three thousand, five thousand as well that I use on the local system here. Gotcha. Okay. So. So yeah, so you're no stranger then to uh, to set things up like that too. So oh no, and yeah. uh, like I said, you know, we, we talked earlier too about you having the the broadcastify stuff and the SDR. So you know, you're you're kind of it, setting up something like this is kind of uh, what you're used to, right? You're used to pre pre yeah. planning everything and setting up exactly what you want to listen to. Because again, when you when you have the the SDRs at home and you're walking around with your phone, you've got no control of what it is you're listening to. So you've already got to have that set up ahead of time. So in order for you to map things out here, what I'm trying to say is this is this is where your your comfort zone is. This is nothing new to you, right? Well, another thing that is nice is that. You know, just a quick little sidetrack here. Like I have a call note for our system here at home. So if I'm on the pager and I miss something that's not recorded, I have it all backed up and I can just go and pull something up that I forgot, which I've actually used pretty frequently. I was going to ask you that too. Do you use the record feature on the pager to uh, to capture oh. the talk groups? <laughs> Absolutely. I actually, yeah. as I said earlier, I have upwards of 20 plus two tones that are all recording. Those are all mm -hmm. the, um, our county fire, the county and city are different. The city doesn't use two tones, but the county does. And I have them all set up for two tones and they'll record. All of them will, are set to record if any of them trip the pager whatsoever, which is awesome. Right, but I'm talking about just the regular talk groups too. So they don't go out with a two tone. You're still recording just the voice traffic on some channels? Yeah, some of them I have on there. Some of them talk so much that if I were to have them recording, yeah. it would yeah, <laughs> it would take up the memory pretty quick. Right. Yeah, you don't want to have the PD dispatch right uh, too much right. on recording. Well, like that because, I yeah. I am trying to work something out. Um, our channel here, our PD channel here, send out a what they call a Sputnik tone. It's like a thousand hertz tone, and what they'll do is if there's like a major event on channel, they'll play the tone. I'm trying to get right. that to do code so I can record the incident that way. Gotcha. Yeah, yeah, that's a good idea as well. I mean, even like the you know National Weather Service puts out there was it a 10, mm -hmm. 10 50 tone, whatever it is, when they have a bulletin to say. And again, the pages work really well for that. If you had a VHF pager, which you know right. <laughs> the chief force. So that's again, that's part of what we talk about the planning with things. But uh, but yeah, it, there be, should be no reason why the pager can't pick up on that tone as long as it goes out for shorter or longer than what your timer is set for on the pager right. so that it recognizes as being a valid tone. And uh, again, I mean, there's, there's uh, departments up here that do that for say, if it's a working house fire and they gotta, they have to send out a, you know, a, a notice, they'll, they'll put that tone over a special tone. Or even if you listen to NYPD, they'll do the same thing. If there's an open mic or there's a broadcast or a bulletin, they've got to make sure that the, that the officers all here, they'll put that tone out there as well. So again, to have the pager pick up on that is is definitely good thinking. So you'll you'll capture what the the uh, the mm -hmm. urgent message was, so to speak. Right, and you know our system here uses tones kind of heavily. Our, I mean, they put that Sputnik tone out on our fire ground channels if a call's coming in. So that way, that can tell people that are monitoring, like, hey, you need to be near your pager, or you need to be near your, your uh, station because our alert channel for our city fire, it's a talk group on the system, but it usually feeds through the um, PA at the station, which the, it's like a, they encode a tone, but we can't hear it over the system. If that makes sense. Okay. Yep. Yep. Definitely. So that's, that's interesting. So at least if you listen to fire grounds, you know, to switch over or to get another, another right. radio. So and, very and interesting. Uh, we have an interesting setup here too, as like, our county fire gives a lot of information about the call and the tone out. Well, on the city, they just say like, you know, 19 year old male uh, in the address, like they'll give you the address and that's it. You have to go to fire one. That's what we call it here. The first fire ground to even hear that information. Like they'll give you a lot of it. Like they'll give you, you know, the, the type of call, you know, like they kind right. of spit it details. back out. If that makes sense. Yeah. 
Right, right. So do you use the uh, the bind feature then in the pager so that when the, the tones do go out, then the pager goes into the uh, secondary scan list so that you don't have to flip over into two, uh, different positions? So what's funny is actually I do, I do not use that funny enough. I actually have one one knob position that has it has the tone outs as priority, which is another okay. feature that the PPS has, which you can put the talk groups of the tone outs as priority and it takes it over the fire grounds, if that makes sense. So, you know, if the if someone's talking on fire ground one and there is a, uh, a call that comes out, it'll automatically switch to the tone out channel. And then usually what I do is I'll, if it's on, if it's a structure fire and they say to use channel two, I'll wait for them to pop up on channel two and I'll just hit the hold button and sit on it for the remainder of the event. Gotcha. Yep. That's definitely another way you can do that as well. So, but uh, for everybody who doesn't understand, the, the bind feature basically tells the pager what to do after it has tones. So there's different different things you can do and you can go into sub scans basically. So if uh, there's, there's a tone out that happens on a dispatch channel, it can then say, okay, this is my scan list afterwards. And then it can revert back into you know, the dispatch channel and go back into what it was doing prior. Another thing I like to do also with some of the pagers is I'll set up like a, uh, I'll put, this is mostly for conventional at this point though, but if you have, um, if you want to keep the pager quiet and only scan the fire ground with the dispatch after you've been dispatched out, I'll put tones in all the, all the, the frequencies I want to, I want to have in the scan list. And then as soon as the dispatcher tones out on the dispatch channel, then I put the pager into manual reset mode. So this way the fire ground channel stays open, everything else stays open in the scan list until you go ahead in there and reset it. And then the page, of course, is silent again. So you don't hear all the other nonsense going on on any other fire ground channels until you have another, you know, another call you want to hear. So there's a lot of different funny ways you can yeah. set these things <laughs> up to do uh, to do what you want them to do. So yeah. but uh all right. So it sounds like though you've you've kind of uh figured out a lot of this stuff to optimize the pager to work in your in your favor when you're actually out and traveling. So do you have any other uh, tips or suggestions or lessons learned when setting up your, your pager to basically roam around a large geographical area, multi-states, multi-counties, and, and those kinds of things? I'm Again, as I touched on the topic earlier, the biggest thing I did learn is, you know, radio reference is not always accurate. The full spectrum scan is always a good one. And to be honest, this idea came after, you know, I, I had the beta firmware for 1.4. Mm-hmm. Great firmware, but my pager just did not like it at all. It just kept crashing left and right, and it was just a pain to take care of and just run. I couldn't really do anything. It crashed every like five minutes. I'm hoping they can get that worked out here eventually and release the 1.4 because, you know, having that scan, that, that control channel scan was really nice. But at the end of the day, having a kind of a having the way I have it set up is like it's a pre-made way of steering it in the right direction instead of just going around aimlessly. If that makes sense. Even if you don't have a statewide system, I would recommend just putting in a zone that has all of your all of your countywide systems in your state. They may be very spread far apart, but I do recommend doing that. Just just depending on it all, it almost preference. I mean, if you're not traveling that much. No, I mean I wouldn't if I'm not tra- if I'm not traveling a lot. But like if I'm going like I'm very I commonly go into these statewide systems not as often as I want to obviously, but I do still have them set up. I always you know as a pilot you got to think as because I got to think about contingencies. The what if? What if I go right. here? What am I going to do? Right. So I always like to have it set up for anything and everything I can, even if it's a mutual aid a call channel that's never that rarely ever talks. I like, I have that in there just on the off chance primary communication fails on a trunking system. I still have it in a statewide environment just on the off chance. Right. Right. But again, too, you're also a scanner radio user. You understand that that's gotta be in there as well. I mean, that's, right. that's always what I say to you. You want to put in, right. You want to have at least one radio set up for that. Uh, when it hits the fan, right. It, you know, right. you've got your power system in there. You got your gas company in there. You've got the OEM company, you know, OEM departments in there. And anything else, you're going to want a tactical Red Cross, et cetera, et cetera, so that uh, you're good to go. And it sounds like you've you've set up your pager just based on what you've learned, right, with uh, with flying, that you've got to you got to make sure you got everything ready to go just in case you need it, at, rather than scrambling at the last minute. And then that's not really when you want right. to be plugging in frequencies and in when you're trying to pilot an aircraft. 
<laughs> right. Well, the the big thing I ended up learning too was when I was driving. You know, if I you know, sometimes I go with my father on business, and you know he covers Indiana and Tennessee as well as his job. And when I go with him, sometimes it's like a like a late, like it's like a last minute decision that I made for myself. So that's why I went on ahead and pre did it already. I went on ahead and planned and thought ahead and said, like, okay, if I'm going into Ohio, I have this. If I'm going to Indiana, I have this as well. Or if I go into Tennessee, I have this as well. Yep. And plus, you can always tweak it, right? Once you get to where you got to right. go, if you're not here, once you expect to hear, then of course, then you can go ahead and you can update. So nothing is really set in stone. You do have the ability to, once you check into the hotel, like, oh, I didn't hear this or I didn't hear that, then you can go into radio reference and see if something's moved or the other, you know, that just a, the difficult thing here is what we said earlier is the, the layers, right? The layers on the trunk systems and the, and just the natural way that P25 works. If there's no radios on a particular layer, the talk group may not end up there. Likewise, if, um, if you're if they're not supposed to be in there at all, like like I said here, you know, on on the PDs on the 800, but all the FDs on the 700. So if you have just FD talk groups in the pager and you're stuck on the 800, you're never going to hear anything. Likewise, if you're stuck in the 700 and all you have is PD in there, which are 800 talk groups, you're not going to hear anything either. So sometimes that alone can can really mess with your programming. So the more information there is in radio reference like that's what i'm trying to do when i when i update the database for suffolk county is what layer are these talk groups on so a lot of the systems in radio reference they don't have that information in there so that's again one of those things you've got to kind of learn on the fly or maybe take note of on your page you're like okay well i didn't hear this talk group at all and i was expecting to hear more on this activity maybe it's you know maybe it is somewhere else or that's really where the SDR comes in and you can actually start looking at the different layers and, and fine tuning the pager. So, you know, next time, you know, when you go out that, uh, that what's going on there. And here's another option, you know, just having different references, not a hundred percent, but you could also look at broadcastify call. No, they may have one for the state you're in possibly just as maybe a reference or, you know, if the pager's not working the way you want it, you could pull that up as like a backup, if that makes sense. Yep. Yeah, you could always definitely right double check your stuff by listening to Broadcastify and seeing. Okay, I'm, I'm hearing on the internet. Why aren't I hearing it out of right. my radio? And that would have to include you into to an issue. So there's definitely a lot of ways that you can debug it. But again, when you had a scanner and you put the different layers in there, then of course you would probably hear it because the scanner is going to run through all the different layers of that that trunk system. And mm-hmm. if you name it. With the le- with the name, you know, I just name. Uh, that's that's one of the things I do is I, I just name it. You know, simple. I, I, all all the sites get the same name because that's what I want to see on this on the scanner. But if you were out traveling, you'd want to see this layer, that layer, or whatever else it is. So it helps you define what it is you're doing. So you, you can go ahead and program that that uh, that pager most efficiently for for what it's going to be doing. So, uh, but it sounds like though you've gotten you figured it out. You you've you've cracked the code. You understand what you have to do when it comes to programming the pager for traveling what the limitations are and also where it excels and, and where things can really work well for you. And I like the idea that you put the wild cards in because that, again, that shows that you are thinking a little bit outside the box when it comes to, to setting things up and, and understanding how the programming works. Yeah, and the biggest thing too, is like, if you're driving the vehicle, I would just switch to the state police and stick on it because I wouldn't want to be on an, a monitor selection and look like I'm texting and driving. I don't want to be distracted, obviously, when I'm driving, especially right. if it's an eight or nine hour drive. So I usually just sit on the state police because I know for a fact that I'm going to at least, I'm going to get that. And I have tried the setup in Ohio and Indiana and it has worked. I've not tried Tennessee yet. So I'm, uh, Tennessee is the one with the biggest headache for me, or at least it has been because I, I did the wild card for Indiana, Ohio, but I didn't do it for Tennessee. And, before I just put all the sites and all the control channels in there. And yes, some of them are not seven or 800 sites, but all the ones that are, and it would just crash left and right. And that's actually where I had the biggest problem was in Tennessee. Gotcha. Cause the size of the system and all the different site layers on there. So yeah. Okay, so I, gotcha. I have, I have yet to yet to try out Tennessee. So I'm hoping to do so okay. here, hopefully here soon. Yeah. Well, I definitely would uh, love to hear your feedback on that one when you, when you go out there and try the wild card. But again, it sounds like you've, you've figured it out, right? Like that's, that's the way that you have to program it up. So that does work really well for you. So anything else with the, uh, with the page you want to share or anything else that you've learned? 
Another thing, I'm trying to think off the top of my head here. Don't be afraid to program, and I said this probably, I might be a broken record here. Don't be afraid to program interop stuff like the conventional seven call or eight call stuff. You may never have to use it, but it's always good to have it. I may have felt like a broken record, but <laughs> no, no, that's fine. And, and again, too, you, you may find out that they're they're used as uh, simplex channels, right? That's what they're for. Yeah. So again, the, the county system next to me—that's what they do. They they don't have a talk group, right? They actually it actually says that that you can listen to them on the uh, the eight tac channels and the seven tac channels when they go car to car. So right. they do fall off the wow. trunk system and they do go direct <laughs> and point to point. So I guess if you were on a big accident scene and they were trying to direct traffic, you may actually find them there. And so that's really definitely a good point to have them in there as well. Well, I actually learned my lesson on that because I was traveling. I took the pager only and it was a weekend that I went from Louisville to Richmond. It was sometime in the winter. Uh, what happened was is that I was in between Jefferson County and Scott County, which is actually just near Lexington. I can pick them up on the way into Lexington. And the whole drive's about an hour and a half. And I would sit on eight call and the TAC channels just to have it running, just to have something mm-hmm. running. And I only had the analog because in radio reference, it says it's all analog. It was coming through as digital. <laughs> so yeah, sure. I had to go back. I had to go back the night before and I ended up splitting it into two zones, one for analog, one for digital. And I can just adjust it as necessary. If I need to, if it's analog, I'll stay on one zone. If it's digital, I'll stay on the other. Got you. You should probably set that up as a scanless stove in both channels and just have it scan back and forth between analog and digital. And I do so. have that as well. It's got 10 <laughs> channels in it and it's got both an analog and digital. I did actually just set that up about, I think last week when I was, because okay. every once in a while I will sit down at my desk and I get bored and I start like moving stuff around and renaming stuff. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Well, that's part of the hobby, right? Yeah, you always exactly. gotta, you've always got to adjust something. So yeah, that's that's definitely part of the hobby. So excellent, excellent. So it and, sounds and, so. Yep, go ahead. Oh, sorry. So it also, it may, maybe you don't have a unication pager, but for example, I have a uh, EF Johnson that I use for state police, and the same thing could kind of be said in a conventional multicast system statewide, like. It took me, and it's manually programming on the EF Johnson. It's not a scanner. It, well, it, it's not a scanner. It's a commercial. But mm-hmm. I was able to get that programmed in with all 16 posts, state police posts. And it took me about an hour and a half to program that all in. And, you know, it's all about just tweaking and figuring out what's working and what's not. Maybe those frequencies are incorrect or, you know, something like that. But so far, I've had a good dealings with it so far. And I actually just purchased it about a week and a action up a week ago, I want to say about four weeks okay. ago. And the first thing I did was sat down for about an hour and a half and pl- plugged in it, in it. And it's pretty much a statewide radio for the state of Kentucky. Cause again, state police, the word is they're moving to a seven, 800. I want to say 700 statewide system and are moving to encryption, the, the dirty E, but um, right now they're on a, uh, <laughs> they're on a uh, UHF multicast P25 statewide link okay. system right now so gotcha well at least you figured out how to set that one up as well so yeah that's an excuse to get the g5 see yeah <laughs> <laughs> i've already uh my uh buddy uh jackson who's actually been on the podcast before uh, yeah he, yeah he, he just purchased a uh he traded in his g4 for a g5 that has um uhf and dmr and nice kind of i kind of want to get it because we do now have <laughs> right and <laughs> we do have um, some 800 DMR that I kind of want to get the upgrade for, but uh-huh. it's Connect. It's Connect Plus, so it's not going to help you. Up. Yeah, no. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So yep. yeah, so yeah, the DMR only does tier one, tier two, which is basically conventional and simplex, so no no trunking. But uh, but yeah, I mean the pager is is definitely. Uh, Definitely a unique animal. And again, that's why when somebody calls me up and they want to talk about it, I say, look, it's it's a pager first, right? And people do use it as a scanner. And, um, you know, it's it's just the limitations that are there, but also some of the strengths. Again, like it's it works like gangbusters and simulcast is, you know, it's, it's very hard to find something that will work as well. I mean, the SDS 100 and 200 work really well. I, I just think that the quality, the voice quality is, is a little bit better on the Unication product. And, uh, you know, it's a lot more portable than taking around OP25 with you. So, <laughs> Well, it's funny you say that because I got two points on that. I actually just got a Raspberry Pi working with OP25. 
And it's kind of interesting how I'm trying to get that worked out right now. It's not a hundred percent and it's not a hundred percent together, but it's currently, it is mobile. I can take it anywhere I want to. It's, mm-hmm. I still got to build onto it. But, um, the other point is, is I actually, when I went through uh, you as a dealer for East coast pagers, I actually demoed one of the units. This was after our second podcast in 2019, like just at the end of the year. And I just, I was like, you know, I was torn between SDS 100 and a G4. And I was just like, you know, I've tested the G, the, the pager. So I know it's going to work. I'm, I'm more of a person that, you know, if I'm going to, because I was on a yep. budget still, but luckily I got the, the funds during COVID to buy a G4. I just was like, I can't just spend $650 on an SDS 100 if I don't know if it's not going to work or not. Cause I've heard some people having issues with it. Right, right. Yeah, there's a whole filter issue, but it's, you know, Mm -hmm. it it depends where you are as well. But the other thing is too, is, is, um, not to, not to go one with the other with it too, but (laughs) there, there is a difference in class, right? One's consumer grade, one's commercial grade. So there is definitely a build quality difference between the two of them. But again, one's more built towards the hobbyist where you can do things with the front panel, right? You, with the SDS 100, you can hold, you can resume, you can program, you got the whole screen on it. You can, you know, you, you got the whole radio reference database built into it. Whereas the communication product, it's pre-programming and setting things up ahead of time. And, you know, it's, it's made for somebody that is going to be using it as a a learning device. So it, it, the, it's, it's more simplistic as far as I need to turn a dial and that's really what I need to worry about. And if I have to go beyond those eight positions, then I've got more additional zones to get me there. So that's, that's his primary purpose. But you know, it, like I said, people buy them as scanners and, and most of my sales are for people that want to use them in that, in that fashion. So it's, right. uh, it, it definitely does does its job very well on both on well, both ends of the spectrum. The, the other thing too, I, I'm going to say I partially regret it, and I, I told Jackson this too. I don't, I don't think he'll mind. I'm just talking about it. I I kind of was like, I kind of regret getting this, and he goes, "No, you're not going to regret it." Because when I say I partially regretted it, I, I don't mm-hmm. I don't fully like I'm like, oh darn it, I shouldn't have done this. No, I'm perfectly okay with having this. But um, the one thing I'm really missing is the other modes. I'm missing. You know, I have my whole fleet is mostly VHF, UHF, and 800. It's all analog right. or P25. I have some DMR sprinkled in there, but I don't have NXD in covered. And there are a couple sites or systems, I have to say, here in Louisville that have Next Edge. And I just have to use the, I kind of have to use the SDRs to try and get around that. But that's the one thing I, I do kind of miss is not having that, those extra modes. But again, my primary scanning is 7800. So, but right there in 7800, it performs perfectly and it performs amazingly. And the right. how and, and again, it if, is, <laughs> the, the yeah, size yeah, of Yeah, the size difference. Yeah. I can just but, like put this in my back pocket and not even know it's there. Right. And and the way it sounds like you've been carrying it around, it, it, it spends a lot of time, you know, with you anyway. But uh, again, if we pair, if you compare the SDS 100 to the pager, they're both around the same price point. But once you add in the DMR and right. the NXDN, now we're selling you up seventy five dollars and seventy five dollars even more, right? So you now you know one hundred twenty five dollars on top of what you just spent. So now, yeah, you you'd have the extra one hundred twenty five dollars. You'd have DMR and NXDN that you don't have on, on the pager. But again, you know, you're, you're, you're comparing something that is, you know, consumer grade and commercial grade. And the pager was just never designed to do those two features because the amount of fire service that is on either one of those modes, right. It's, it was made for P25. It's why it doesn't do right. type two. It doesn't do any, you know, eat action or anything else like that or LTR because for public safety, they're all going P25. That's that's where things are completely migrating over to as a standard. So it makes sense to have the page that does analog plus P25. In order to, to kind of bridge that gap, because again, a lot of departments are using DMR as opposed to going on repeaters now just to just to get more benefit for the buck on their FCC licenses, right? They are doing DMR. And that kind of that kind of gets you over that little that little hump over there. So mm-hmm. But uh, again, it sounds like you know you've 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 got this thing nailed out, man. You've you've you're you're a power user <laughs> when it comes to figuring <laughs> out you know how 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 it works. And and I definitely uh, tip my hat to you on, on how well you've you've actually tweaked it and figured it out. And 
All right. Anything else you want to uh, talk about when it comes to uh, scanning or lessons learned with uh, with the Unication product? So I just I'm going to do like a little plug here. I have actually sure. I've been off of YouTube for a while, but I I did start making YouTube videos a couple months ago, and I'm going to start doing it again. Where I do go into uh, tutorials on SDR, and I did do Unication a time or two. And, you know, what we talk about here, I'm planning on, and then when I approached you about this idea for this podcast, I do want to make a video explaining how it looks and how to do it on the PPS software. Excellent. So why don't you drop the name of the channel here? That's way if anybody wants to see how you did your setup and, and how uh, you, you're traveling with the pager, why don't you uh, leave the, the name of your channel here? This way okay. we can not only link to it in the show notes, but anybody that wants to check it out can check it out right now. So my channel name is Nate the Robot. It's, <laughs> it was a error in judgment on the the name of it, but I went ahead and rolled with it. As of uh, as of you and me recording this podcast, um, it's still the video is not out just yet. I'm hoping by the time the podcast comes out, it will be released by then, or at least before okay. then. So um, that is. But even worse, that, I mean. Uh, they can always subscribe to your channel and, and hit right. that little bell icon. So when you do release it, right, it, they'll be right. they'll be notified and ready to go. So and yeah, I've already, no harm in that I've either. Already, I've already got um, videos on basically how to you know make sure you're selecting the right um, the correct code plug for the right page with the serial number. Um, you know stuff including you know how to set up a system manually with talk groups. Um, I think I did cover the import feature for Radio Reference as well on there as well. Um, and I also did it for SDR trunk as well. And then I did end it up uh, on our last video, or not last video, on the last podcast we did, I think, where we talked about Ze- using Zello and TeamViewer. Or no, we talked about using Zello in a uh, SDR software. I ended up didn't make a tutorial on how to do that as well. But I, asked, I okay. added TeamViewer as a layer so you can make changes to the frequency on the fly, if that makes sense. Yes, smart thinking. So with TeamViewer, you can obviously make the changes from your phone or your another computer. So, but um, with the uh, Unication stuff, again, I will be releasing that hopefully sometime soon on how to scan a statewide system, basically. Excellent. So again, the YouTube channel is called Nate the Robot. N A T E T H E R O B O T, right? Nate the yes, Robot. Sir. Yes. Yep. Excellent. And then. Uh, if they want to reach out to you any other way, I mean, is, is leaving a comments in the video is the best way to get a hold of you, or do you have any other way that uh, that you can be reached? <laughs> comments, yes. Comments on YouTube, I'm actually very behind on them. <laughs> I, I get random, like when I'm out. Yeah, I'm just like, oh crap, I really need to read some of these. I feel, I really feel bad because I want to be that person that's like answering every question. Um, another thing too is, and I, I feel kind of weird for doing it, but I've kind of been diving into TikTok a little bit. I've been making, funny enough, I've actually been making videos just of, you know, what I hear, just like random stuff that I'm picking up on the radios and on the airwaves. Okay. What's the, uh, what, what's the account over there? Is it still Nate the Robot over it's, there? Yeah. It's except for that, instead of spaces, it's uh, under, uh, it's lowercase, or not lowercase. Oh, um, underscore. I can't even think of it. Underscore. Why did I blank on that? <laughs> <laughs> but, um, no problem. But, but that's, that's not more of it. It's not really an instruction type thing. I just, you know, I just like, you know, whatever I, you know, hear or on the page right. or something, I just record it and put it out there. So nice. Nice. All right. Sounds good, Nate. Well, again, I want to thank you so much for being back for the third time now on, uh, on the podcast. And every time you come in here, it's, it's definitely quality stuff that you're bringing here. So again, the first time you were on, it was, it was what, uh, scanning on a budget, right? We, we talked about that. Mm-hmm. And then we did, uh, we do again, we did SDRs, I think as, a, as the second one, is that what we did? We did. And so then, yeah, we talked about SDRs, but we did the simulcast issues. Simulcast. Okay. That was it. Simulcast issues. Right, right, right. And then uh, I think both times we talked about SDRs and everything else like that. And again, third mm-hmm. time here, we went back on the uh, <laughs> how you travel with Unication. Well, I'm sure like, we'll, we'll figure out something else for the fourth time. <laughs> right. <laughs> so. I, will, I will say this. I will say it again. I know you said it a lot, too. It's always good to have an SDR, at least as one yes. of your radios, at least one. Yep. So, it definitely is. I would say that to anyone. Yep. 
All right, Nate. Well, I won't hold you anymore. It's been it's been uh, definitely a good conversation, and I definitely appreciate you coming back. And again, this was your uh, your idea, right? You came to me yes, and sir. said, "Hey, I want to put this on a podcast." So you basically just went online. You went to a scannerschool dot com slash guest, and that brought up the calendar. And you just basically just picked a date and time. In fact, you even rescheduled too on your own as yeah. well. So you, you you booked a date and time, which is good <laughs> because it actually wouldn't have worked for me either. And oh, wow. uh, <laughs> you you were able to to change the date and time all through all through the online system. So assuming since you're able to do that, everything was was very easy to set up, right? Oh, I mean, there shouldn't be any oh, issues where somebody else wants to try and do it. Yeah, excellent. That's super easy. So, yeah, perfect. So again, Nate, thanks again. Definitely love having you on the podcast, and I uh, look forward to the next time that we can uh, bring you back on. Oh, of course, I I'm glad to come back. Hopefully, sometime here soon. Sounds good, Nate. Thanks again. All right, thank you. Nathan, again, thank you so much for coming back on the podcast for a third time. Really do appreciate you coming on the podcast. And again, this I was Nathan's idea, right? This was not something that I pre-planned or or dropped in here, right? Nathan came to me and says, hey, I, I just went for a road trip and uh, I used my communication pager. I'd like to tell people how I set this up so that we can use it while on the road. So again, Nathan went on to my website, scannerschool.com. He went to be a guest, and using the calendar, he picked a date and the time that worked well for him and I. Funny story is, though, is that he discovered that the original date didn't work, so he was actually able to go in there, change the date and time of his uh, guest appearance on his own. Luckily, that also worked out much better for me as well, so it was a win-win for the two of us. But look, the point of this story here right now is, I'm looking for podcast guests. I want you to come on the podcast and talk about what it is that you enjoy about the hobby, something that you are doing in the hobby that you think other people would get a kick out of. It's great to have your story on here as well as my story, especially that we're getting close to episode number 200. So again, go to scannerschool.com slash guest, fill out the guest form, pick a time and a date, And let's have a conversation about what it is that you do with the Scanner Radio Hobby on the podcast. Now, again, if that's not something that interests you, that's great. But what I would ask you to do is make sure you subscribe to the podcast. Make sure you share the podcast with somebody you think would benefit from learning or listening to the podcast episodes. Because this is how we help more people, right? When you share the podcast with others, we can help more people. And that is the goal of Scanner School. Make sure you subscribe to the podcast. Make sure you check out our growing YouTube channel. Hey, make sure you check out our social media channels too because we're dropping memes now every Monday through Friday. Some of them are funny. Some of them are cringeworthy. I'm going to leave it up to you to decide which is which. So with that, we are getting close to episode 200. Hope you can stick around for that podcast episode. I've got some of my little tricks up my sleeve for that one. And again, my name is Philip Tenberger, and this is Scanner School. We teach you everything to know about the Scanner Radio Hobby. We'll catch you all again next Tuesday. Thanks again for listening, and 73.